Deirdre said, I'm the owner and director of Knowledge for Health. That's my company that I set up because I believe that knowledge is one of the most important things we can have in order to keep ourselves healthy. Um, I consultant to MPL Health, who are a corporate wellness platform, and as Deirdre just said, consultant presenter with Farm and Ord and agent for Nouveau Healthcare here. I'm registered with the NTOI, which is Nutritional Therapists of Ireland, the Institute for Functional Medicine and the American Nutrition Association. So I'm not going to really bore you too much with my professional history. You know, we've all done all our training and all whatever, but my personal history is really why I'm involved in working in nutrition and lifestyle. So I'm from a family of eight. There are six children. I had five brothers and me, I'm number six. And when I was seven years old, my brother, second to eldest brother, had a motorbike accident. And he had to live with an acquired brain injury from the age of 17 onwards. And that greatly impacted him, but it also greatly impacted my parents and all of our family life after that. So, um, you know, the impact of a brain injury and an acquired brain injury was something I, I was very, very interested in from a very young age. My mother cared for him. She became his primary carer and it was difficult, often very stressful for her. And she had quite a few heart attacks and ultimately had a triple bypass when she was 63. Later, she developed stomach cancer and she passed away when she was 72. So all of those years of prolonged stress really had an impact on her health and they took their toll. And um, not even two years after that, my own husband was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and he passed away about four months later and left myself and my two young children behind. And I really decided to learn about nutrition at that point in order to keep myself healthy and to keep my children healthy and to look at ways that I could mitigate any health risk for them, because obviously they have a genetic predisposition to that. And I really do believe in the power of nutrition and lifestyle to prevent chronic illness and at least be a vital part of that picture alongside modern medicine to support those with chronic illness. Um, often finding people a route out of chronic illness. And as Deirdre said, my preferred areas of work are brain health, metabolic health, and gut health. And those three are not mutually exclusive. In fact, they interact with each other on, on quite a high level. Um, so I'm going to talk today about migraine, obviously, a short summary. Um, I'm not going to dwell too long on that because we're, I'm sure you're all you know, painfully familiar with what migraine is. Um, I'm going to talk about functional medicine. What is it? The timeline and the matrix of functional medicine and how we can use them. Hormones and their link to histamine and migraine. And then how to use nutrition and lifestyle to decrease migraine severity and frequency. And then particular food triggers for, for migraine and some suggestions on how to navigate the Christmas season. So Migraine, we know a complex neurological condition, uh, about 12 to 15% of Irish people suffer with migraine. So that's half a million sufferers and there's lots of different types. All of this information is available on the Migraine Association of Ireland website. They've got some great information on there. And despite you know, these, these statistics, which you know means that like half a million people suffer with migraine in Ireland, it's still a very misunderstood condition um, and undermanaged condition. It's kind of almost up there, like the dirty secret of perimenopause and menopause that we're all learning about now and the impact that that has on, on women um, on, on that life stage. Um, and we need to kind of raise the profile, I think, of migraine similarly so that employers um, can understand, you know, the struggles and the impact that, that migraine certainly has on people that, that suffer with it. Um, Likewise, with this slide, I'm not going to dwell on this. A lot of this information I've taken from the Migraine Association of Ireland website. They have some really great detailed information there on their website that you can go and read about and some great educational resources. What I will say is something about treatments, um, often extremely effective, um, pain-killing medications or chemicals that block receptors in the brain to alleviate symptoms. They're essential, I'm sure, to the survival of a migraineur in that they alleviate the pain. But the question is, do they really get to the root cause for that person of what's causing the migraine, you know, in the first place? And um, if they do, you know, totally alleviate the pain and the symptoms, then that's great. 
But we have to remember that an awful lot of treatments and medications do come with their own set of side effects. And it's something we need to be mindful of if we're taking them, especially if we're taking them long term. Um, in functional medicine, we try to dig deeper into what the root cause of my, might be of causing the migraine. Um, so what is functional medicine, I suppose, is the real question. That's where I want to start. So in functional medicine, what we're trying to do is we're trying to ask how and why illness occurs. And we're aiming to restore health by helping to address the root cause of disease for each individual. And it's really important that we focus on the individual. Um, we see illness and health as kind of a continuum. Um, so it's a continuum where our bodies and our minds interact with the environment around us. And as a result of that interaction, we have health or ill health. And by environment, we mean the environment that we create for ourselves to exist in, um, you know, from where we are, you know, where we live, whether we live in a city or we live in the countryside, what we do, what we do for work, what we do for leisure, how we work, how we eat, how we sleep, how we exercise, what we eat and drink, what we put on our skin, what we use as cleaning products, all of those things, how we respond to stress, what we do to relax, who we surround ourselves with and how those people treat us and how they influence us. All of those contributory factors create the environment that we bathe ourselves in on a day-to-day -day basis. And the interaction between our bodies and our minds and that environment produces patterns and it produces effects that change over time, either positively or negatively. So technically, functional medicine can be described as the application of systems biology. So it's the biology of our systems, how environment affects our biological systems. So I refer to the kind of illness wellness continuum. So we all exist somewhere on this continuum and, and it changes for us throughout our lives, um, improving and disimproving throughout our lives. Ideally, we'd all love to be a number 10, right? So optimal health, 100% function, active participation in life, we feel great, we wake up with energy and vigor in the morning. That's fantastic. Most of us, if we're honest, exist in the area between four and six. We're kind of neutral. Um, we've no real symptoms of anything. Nutrition is inconsistent, exercise is sporadic. We're not really focused on our health. It's very, very easy for us to slip from a four to six back into poor health or disease. And why that happens is when you're in a neutral situation, if there's any perturbation in your life or any perturbation to your health, which can be totally outside of your own control. I mean, it could be an infection. You could have to have surgery. You could have an accident. You could have a stressful life event or a trauma. You could have a bereavement, anything like that. And um, you don't have the physiological reserve from an immune standpoint, from a nutrient standpoint, or even a psychological standpoint, when you're in neutral, to remain in neutral. And it's really easy to slip into ill health. And I know, like goodness knows, the last two years, our health has become the center of everything really, um, and how vital it is for us to, to focus on our health. Um, so chronic disease, if, if you're looking at the kind of zero, one, two, three areas, that's usually preceded by a period of declining function in one or more of the body systems. And we'll be getting messages. We'll be getting clues from our bodies that something's not right. Um, and restoring health really requires improving specific dysfunction that has contributed to the disease state in the first place. So back to the functional medicine tree. So the leaves of this tree are all the different um, areas of our body that we can experience symptoms or diseases that your doctor or your consultant may have diagnosed you with. The trunk then is like a highway where the body systems should be working well to deliver all the essential nutrients and raw materials and things. And that's where we see clinical imbalances. So a functional medicine practitioner works kind of like a detective and we ask loads and loads of questions and we ask loads about your history and loads about how you're feeling and how you eat and how you sleep. And we explore all the different imbalances and the different body systems that might give rise to these symptoms. And I, I'll relate that back to migraine for you a little bit later on. So if we're looking at the fundamental systems and core clinical imbalances, 
these are core areas where our systems can be malfunctioning or not operating optimally. So assimilation is digestion, absorption of nutrients. Defense and repair is our immune system and inflammatory imbalances. Energy is basically how we make our energy. You know, how we get energy from our mitochondria. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about mitochondria later, which are the tiny little things inside our cells, energy making factories that are essential to um, producing energy within each cell. And that's really, really important, particularly for migraine sufferers. Biotransformation and elimination. These are the systems that convert and then remove waste from our bodies. And um, that's sometimes called detoxification, but you know, detox is such a dirty word. I don't like to say that a lot of the time these days. And I don't mean the kind of trendy detox. I mean, the actual chemical reactions that are happening within your body to transform waste into feces and urine and remove it from the body. And then communication and circulation. That's our hormones, our neurotransmitters. Transportation is our cardiovascular system. So our blood flow and our lymphatic system. And then structural integrity, we're talking about imbalances from the tiny, tiny cells, the structure of the tiniest cell in our body, up to musculoskeletal structure, up to the big structures. And then below that, you'll see antecedents, triggers, and mediators. And I'm going to explain those in detail later. And below that, at the roots of the tree, we see mental, emotional, and spiritual influences genetic predisposition, experiences, attitudes, and beliefs. So we're delving into the root causes here and we're talking about environmental factors and genetic trends that affect our well-being. So we're trying to investigate every aspect that could be influencing your wellness, enabling you to have an active part in your healing. So we're looking really carefully at the mental and emotional, spiritual well-being of the person. It's also important to take into account that human biology is much more complicated than just, than just our genes. You know, um, most diseases, chronic illnesses are actually not genetically determined, even though there appears to be a genetic component. So I work an awful lot with people who have early stage cognitive decline before the development of Alzheimer's disease. And we do a lot of genetic testing and people are always positive that they're going to have the genes for Alzheimer's disease because their mother might have developed Alzheimer's or their grandmother. And it's amazing to see actually how few of them actually have genetic predisposition. Our genes are really important, but it's how the genes express is what's having influence over our health. It's gene expression rather than inheriting certain genes that is essential to disease states emerging. And what influences how genes express is our environment, our lifestyle, our diet, our activity patterns, our psychosocial spiritual patterns, our stress levels. So I had a brilliant lecturer when I was in college who put it like this. You do have the same genetic pattern as your parents, right? So your mother and father. If you bathe your genes in the same environment, that your parents bathe their genes in, then you will likely develop similar illnesses to illnesses that your parents developed. But that's not because you have a genetic predisposition to that. That's because you created the environment for that condition to flourish. And the tools to change that are within your control. So with functional medicine, we're really looking at those modulators of gene expression the environment that's controlled by diet and lifestyle choices. And what we want to do is we want to turn up the volume on the beneficial genes and the good genes that we have and turn down the volume on the ones that have the possibility to be damaging. So there's really kind of two simple questions we need to ask when we're presented with symptoms of an illness. Does this person need to be rid of something, something toxic, allergic, infectious, poor diet, stress? And do they have some unmet individual need required for optimal function? So the primary drivers of disease, what do you need to get rid of? Toxins. So, you know, we could be talking about biologic toxins, elemental toxins, 
synthetic toxins. For allergens, we could be talking about uh, food allergies, mold, a dust allergy, pollen, chemicals. I know that a lot of people who suffer with migraine, their migraines would be triggered by um, you know, new furniture or that new car smell or something like that. That can be the trigger. Um, could it be microbes? Um, do they have an imbalance of bacteria in the gut? Do they have a yeast infection? Do they have parasite or a virus? Um, is it stress? You know, is it physical? You know, it could be an injury. Um, or is it a psychological stress that's raising the inflammation level within their bodies? Or do they have a bad diet? Do they have a high sugar diet with processed foods and lots of preservatives, lots of kind of anti-nutrients that are not really conducive to good health? And then what do we need to put in? What do we need to get to thrive? So we need food, obviously. We need proteins, fats, carbs. We need fiber. We need good, clean water. We need vitamins, minerals antioxidants, phytonutrients, we need light, we need air, we need movement, we need rhythm. So we need flow to our day to optimize our circadian rhythms. And it's a common misconception to think that sleep is the only thing that has a circadian rhythm. Um, lots of things in our physical being have circadian rhythms. Hunger has a circadian rhythm. Exercise. Some people are morning exercises. Some people are evening exercisers. We need good quality sleep. We need love and community and connection. And heaven knows that has been a challenge over the last 18 months to two years. And we also need meaning and purpose in our lives. And all of these things all combine to make a healthy person. So what do we do when a client presents to us as a functional medicine practitioner? So this is what we call the functional medicine timeline. And this is the first thing that I create when I speak to a client. We use a questionnaire and a detailed consultation to fill this out. We look at the client's current symptoms there on the right-hand side, and we fill that out. And then we look at any other illnesses or symptoms that they've had over their lifespan from birth. We go right back through their life and birth and even pre-birth. We look at all the signs and symptoms of disease and we refer to the antecedents, the triggers, and the mediators of illness. So if you remember the functional medicine tree earlier, it's when these antecedents, triggers, and mediators combine with genetics and with our beliefs, experiences, our mental and emotional and spiritual health. When all of these combine, the results can be signs and symptoms of illness. So antecedents, here on the left hand side. These are factors which are genetic or acquired that might predispose an individual to illness. So for example, the family history of something, um, a trauma, toxicity, their intrauterine history. So the mater their mother's health prior to pregnancy and during pregnancy is an antecedent for a person's health when they're born. Um, dietary insufficiencies, drug use, things like that. Triggers then. Triggers tend to be factors that provoke the expression of the symptom. So they can be physical or psychic trauma, uh, a stressful event, for example, maybe moving house or getting divorced. It could be surgery. That's a triggering event. It could be an infection. It could be having to take antibiotics which messes with your microbiome. They're all triggering events. They can be life events. It could be moving house, you know, something that could be stressful for you. And then mediators and perpetuators. These are things that are constantly present, factors that are ongoing, that could be biochemical or psychosocial that contribute to the pathological changes. So we might be talking about constant high levels of insulin, we might be talking about constant high levels of inflammatory chemicals circulating in the blood, ongoing psychological stress, nutrient deficiencies all your life, sleep, chronic sleep deprivation, those kind of ongoing mediators, exposure to mold, that's something that could come up. So the current concerns here for somebody, you know, with migraine, it's migraine, cluster headaches, um, 
The timeline gives me, but it also gives the client an insight into their previous life events and how they could be related to the symptoms that they're experiencing now. It helps us to organize the client's history um, chronologically so that the client can see that the symptoms they developed may have some relation to certain triggers or lifestyle choices that they've made along the way. And it, it enables us to kind of put those associations together. We can see the temporal relationships between all of them. This is a question I ask a lot. And often there's a very, very clear answer. I've never been well since X, or I haven't felt well since Y. There's very often a very clear line in the sand before which there were no symptoms and after which symptoms begin to develop. Um, and the client can say, yeah, I remember not feeling right since then, since that date or since that thing happened. So when we filled out the questionnaire and the timeline and we have all that detail, we use that detail to populate something called the matrix. And this is the functional medicine matrix. And we spoke earlier about all of these clinical imbalances, assimilation and defense and repair and energy. I'm not going to go through them again. And at the center of all of these different body systems is the mental, emotional and spiritual connection. OK, what we need to remember is we fill out the antecedents, the triggering events, the mediators here from the timeline. And across the bottom here, we have what's called modifiable lifestyle factors. Nutrition in the middle, exercise and movement and stress either side, sleep and relaxation and relationships. These are the core areas that we work on first with clients um, to gently move them towards health, because these are the things that are within the power of the person to change. These are the things that are, I won't say easiest to change, but they're the most accessible things for people to change. Um, and at the center is the mental, emotional and spiritual well-being of the person. That's what connects us to the world around us. And, you know, if it's our belief system to a higher, you know, belief system as well. So one of the key things to remember about the matrix is that all the different core areas are connected to each other. So if there's imbalance in one, it will affect another. So I'm going to give you an example. So say somebody has um, compromised digestion. So they're a very stressed person and they might have low hydrochloric acid in their stomach because they're rushing their meals, they're very stressed, they're time poor, they're not chewing correctly. In fact, they don't even think about chewing at all. They just, you know, throw the food in their mouth because they're in a hurry. The kids are stressing them out, work is really busy. Maybe they have some degree of kind of leaky gut syndrome going on in there. So that's where structural integrity comes in. Partially digested food, and leaky gut results in immune triggering and food sensitivities. So defense and repair is involved now. This causes the overproduction of immune chemicals. So now we're in an inflammatory state and we've got an immune response and we start releasing histamine into the system. This overloads our liver and biotransformation and elimination and our liver becomes stressed. Our liver becomes stressed. We are very stressed. This is a communication issue. The neurotransmitters are firing. If you're not digesting correctly, you're not getting all of the nutrients from your food. That results in low energy. So low energy, you also don't have all the proteins you need to repair muscle, make skin, make hair grow, make your nails grow. You don't have the fats you need to make, you know, to get cholesterol. And we use cholesterol that we break down in our diet to make all of our hormones. All of our steroid hormones are made from cholesterol. Our estrogen, our progesterone, our cortisol is made from cholesterol. So you can see there, everything is tied in together. It's all connected. And what we see quite often as well is that one condition can be due to many different imbalances. So overweight and obesity is not just a straightforward calories in, calories out and move more equation. Inflammation, hormones, genetics, diet and exercise, yes, do play a part. Mood disorders, they all feed into obesity. But also we see that one imbalance, like if we have an imbalance in inflammation, 
it can result in lots of different conditions. And inflammation particularly is very closely tied to migraine. So one challenge when we're looking at migraines and prevention of migraine is the underlying etiology of migraine is often not clear. And it's very, very different person to person. So there's a whole range of migraine triggers. I've put a few on this wheel, but I'm sure there's many, many more that you guys could tell me about. So what's triggering the migraine and what's causing it to be chronic? And this is where we can best use the timeline and the matrix. Where does the ink land on the matrix? What area needs the most support from us? And this is what I'm going to show you what a possible timeline and matrix of a migraine sufferer might look like. So there's an awful lot of information on here and I've given Deirdre these slides and if people want the slides afterwards to look back over them, you can request them. So just to talk through this quickly. So the current symptoms this person is experiencing, chronic migraine, food sensitivities with gas and bloating, constipation, allergies, low energy and weight increasing. Okay, what symptoms have they been you know, experiencing over their lives? So over the last five years, low energy, low mood, very sensitive to smells and perfumes and fumes. So this might be very familiar to some of you. you know. This person had postpartum depression after both children. They had hay fever as a teenager. And I put in red things that pop into my head when I'm reading stuff like this, pop into my head, histamine. Very heavy periods, period pains were so bad they missed school, histamine. History of depression from 12 onwards, sensitive to dairy, especially cheese, histamine, histamine, histamine. Then what we look at is the antecedents. So mother suffered with asthma and migraine, father and sister have allergies, father is actually celiac. Grandmother had dementia, sister osteoporosis, and there's a family history of IBS. The mom was very stressed before her birth because she was coping with the death of her own mother. So all of these things are contributing to the health of this person. Now we look at triggers and triggering events. Ear infections as a child, antibiotics. Gut health is going to be impacted by that. Colic as a baby. So obviously there was an issue with the microbiome from early on. Sent to boarding school age 12, but distress, that's a stressful situation. Even if you're happy at school, it's still a big move. Childbirth, baby one and two, moved house at 37. And after the house move, a lot of this sensitivity to smells and fumes and low energy started. So we're thinking, is there something in that house? You know, is there mold? Are there carpets in there that, you know, are disrupting? And then the divorce, divorce at 39. And then we have mediators, good diet as a child, but always a fussy eater. So nutrient status was not great. Very stressful childhood, the eldest of seven, father had OCD and a lot of anger. So there was a lot of stress in this child's life. As a teenager in twenties, which is very, very often the case, high carb, processed foods, lots of alcohol away at college, all of that stuff. Nutrient deficiencies, hormonal imbalance, gut dysbiosis, you know, liver being overburdened, smoking, alcohol, caffeine, a high toxic burden on their liver. And then in the 30s, stress, work stress, and then postnatal depression. Um, and lack of sleep in the past three years. Um, and the past three years is post-divorce, okay? So, you know, this lady is left, you know, not left, but there was a divorce. And, you know, sometimes we go into the, the details of those and sometimes we don't, but she was became a single mother and she still had to hold down a full-time job. Um, and she says then, when we put the information onto her matrix, slept okay till three years ago. Now I find it difficult to fall asleep. So she has to be up and at it for the kids in the morning. So just a lot of stress, a lot of responsibility. Never really been into exercise, not her thing. Standard Western diet, eats very quickly, eats out quite often. Wine makes her sneeze and gives her a terrible hangover. Histamine, tummy issues have always caused her stress. Histamine and dysbiosis. Postnatal depression possibly caused her breakup. So there's a lot of internal anguish and upset there as well. 
single mom, very stressed. She's a bank exec. Her family is supportive. She's lots of great friends. She's not dating. She actually feels a little bit lonely. So you have to take everything into account, all of the stuff that's going on. We put everything from her questionnaire and from the timeline onto the matrix. So she obviously has digestive issues. You know, she's constipation, bloating, gas, dairy sensitivities, allergies and food intolerances. Her mitochondria are impaired. So she has low energy. She has a history of depression, low nutrient status. But most of all, we see the ink landing here on her biotransformation and elimination. Her liver is really overloaded, really, really overloaded. Okay, so with all of that information, where do we start? What do we do first? So we start with the things that are within our control. Number one being water and food. And why do we start with food? We start with food because energy production is so important to brain function and so closely related to migraine. Our brain weighs 2% of our body, but it uses 20% of our energy. So it's really important. And we have to be able to digest and absorb our nutrients in the food. So are we thinking about how and when we eat, how we chew, is it pleasurable? Is it shared? Is it an enjoyable experience? Are we calm? Are we focused on our food or are we watching TV while we're eating? One, two and three here often happen in tandem because they support each other. Drinking enough quality water, taking away food triggers, you know, are all really, really important. Optimizing nutrition and optimizing our habits around nutrition and also fixing our gut. So optimizing nutrient status can sometimes involve adding digestive support sometimes like pancreatic enzymes or hydrochloric acid um, and other supplements that are known, you know, if we know there's a deficiency like um, vitamin D or things like that. Um, balancing hormones and detoxification come later on. So we mentioned mitochondrial dysfunction earlier. So the mitochondria, like I said, they're tiny little energy factories that are in all our cells, except our red blood cells. So don't, we don't have mitochondria in our red blood cells. And different types of tissue have different amounts of mitochondria. So muscles and our liver and our heart have a lot of mitochondria. And our brain has a lot of mitochondria and we want them to be functioning optimally. They generate all the energy within our cells. And a lot of the research out there reports dysfunction of the mitochondria in migraine patients, suggesting that they play a really, really important role in the development and progression of mitochondria. So, so why is that? Research shows us that lack of essential nutrients like magnesium, riboflavin and CoQ10 prevent proper functioning of the mitochondria. And that's a gift that keeps on giving. So if you have low levels of these nutrients, we get reduced performance of the mitochondria. So low production of energy. This causes production of something called reactive oxygen species. So you'll hear me mention this a lot later. So I'm sure you're all familiar with the term free radical. Free radicals are damaging species that circulate around the body and they can damage our cells. They're dangerous to our health. So reactive oxygen species, free radicals, they're the same thing. And when they're present and they're hanging around in our bodies, they can cause damage to cells and that promotes inflammation. So when mitochondria misfire, we see promotion of a thing called microglial activation. So microglia are like a, a neural cell. They're a cell in our brains located to our central nervous system, our brain and our spinal cord. And they're actually an immune cell. They're the same as a macrophage in the immune system. They're the first and the main form of immune defense in the central nervous system. So when microglia are activated, they behave as if they're responding to some sort of a threat, some sort of an attack or an immune attack. So I want you to remember that for later, that the brain's main source of immune response is the microglia. And they are a neural cell and an immune cell and they emit a thing called histamine when they're triggered by inflammation. 
So going back to the energy, we need good levels of magnesium, riboflavin and CoQ10 to make energy. And we have to have our gut in good condition to digest and absorb the food sources of those and also supplemental sources of those. Otherwise, it's just really expensive poo. As we say here, you're putting it all in there, but you're not digesting and absorbing it properly. Now, if you go onto the internet, I did a quick search on the interweb for what diet should I eat for migraine? And you will literally get thousands upon thousands upon thousands of articles, research papers, blogs, recordings, YouTube, everything about which approach is the best one. There's a few here, omega-3 fatty acids, a water only fast, and severe migraines completely eliminated by a plant-based diet, more fish, What's the best diet for migraine? Vegetarian, vegan, pescatarian, pegan, ketogenic, whatever, whatever, whatever. The simple answer is migraine is a complex chronic illness. There is no quick fix. There is no magic pill. Complex chronic illnesses are multifactorial. You have to work out where all the different factors at play are coming from. So, Whatever, what everyone's kind of missing out on in the whole diet thing is biochemical individuality. Everybody is different. There's no one size fits all diet, particularly when it comes to food, because we're all genetically different. Um, we're intrinsically different genetically and our microbiomes are different. But there is one thing that all those diets have in common, the, the ketogenic diet, the paleo diet, all of those. They remove processed foods high in sugar and high in inflammatory fats. That's the number one thing that they all do. They're all like real food diets. They're high in colorful fruits and vegetables and they're high in fiber. They're all rich in healthy fats, omega-3 fatty acids and omega-6 fatty acids. They're high in phytonutrients, colorful. Phyto means plants. So they're high in nutrients from plants, high in antioxidants, really dense in vitamins and minerals. They're high in things called phytoestrogens, so they're plant-based estrogens that behave similarly to estrogens in our bodies. They latch onto our receptors, but they're not as strong as our estrogen. So they modulate estrogen behavior within the body. What these diets will do is they reset your ability to be metabolically flexible. And I'll explain that in a little while. But that basically means you can use both glucose from carbohydrates and ketones from fats both of them for energy, which is really beneficial for your brain. Really, really beneficial for your brain. That's especially true of the extended fasting. They also all support healing of the gut because they're all really high in fiber and prebiotics. So onions and garlic and spring onions and artichokes and all those prebiotic foods because they've got high vegetable content, all these diets and high fiber content. And they all contain large quantities of what we call therapeutic foods, you know, herbs and spices and things like that. So what's the type of eating plan that I work with for people who have um, migraine? I recommend a thing called the Mito food plan. And I don't want to gobble up all our time because I'm nearly 40 minutes in already going through this. I provided the plan to Deirdre in detail and she has all the information on it for anyone that wants it. But basically it's an anti-inflammatory, low to moderate carbohydrate diet that's really high in good quality fats. It's designed to support energy production and that's why it's called the mito food plan, to support the mitochondria. Um, we also have to keep in mind that chewing digesting and absorbing these foods is really, really important. It's an essential step in getting the nutrients and the fuel we need from our food. So we have to eat mindfully. We have to chew properly. We have to enjoy preparing food and make sharing food an enjoyable experience and give it the time that it deserves. The single biggest thing you do on a daily basis is what you put into your mouth three times a day. You do that three times a day, every day. If you, you know, how many times? 21 times a week, you know, multiply it up. You are influencing your health all the time by what you put in. So you can see here, this plan includes 
antioxidant foods, anti-inflammatory nutrients. And I'm going to scare you here now, eight or nine servings of fruit and vegetables a day. Yes, I said eight or nine. Two to three of fruit and five or six of vegetables. Loads of them. High quality dietary fats. Extra virgin olive oil is your best friend. If you can take it off the spoon, do. If you can put it in a smoothie, do. If you can drizzle it over your soup, it's winter now, so we're not eating so many salads, put it into your soup. When I'm making a bolognese, the last thing I do is I put three tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil right before I serve it onto the table. You don't even taste it. Avocados, really great. Low glycemic load, making sure you keep your blood sugar level balanced because we need a stable supply of glucose to the brain. Um, intermittent fasting is really, really beneficial, really beneficial for energy. It's really beneficial for migraine. You know, if your computer is not working right, and I was an engineer, I was an engineer at Intel for 10 years. And they would call me in the middle of the night and they would say, Idel, the equipment's broken down. And you know what the first thing I would say? Have you turned it off and turned it back on again? Step number one in uh, problem resolution. So fasting is kind of like turning your body off and turning it back on again. You're giving it a break. You're giving your digestive system a break. You're giving your detoxification systems a break. You know, I recommend to people if they can, at the very least, stop eating three hours before they go to bed so that you're not digesting food overnight and fast for a minimum of 12 hours overnight. If you can push that out to 14 hours, all the better. Um, low grains, gluten-free if you need to be. I'm not a believer that gluten is the enemy. Some people do have an immune response to gluten. And if you have a response to gluten, you'll know that you're one of those people. You will know that you're one of those people. So in real terms, what does that mean? from a food perspective. And Deirdre has all this information, good quality protein. The palm of your hand is your best friend when you're talking about protein. That's how much protein you need from animal sources at a meal. And everybody's hand is a different size, right? And it's suited perfectly to you, the palm of your hand. It helps stabilize your blood sugar. Try and have a little bit of protein at every meal. It doesn't have to be only from animal sources. If you're getting the palm of your hand from animal sources, you can also supplement the rest of your meal with plant-based sources of protein. Um, Omega-3 rich fatty fish is your friend here. You know, salmon, salmon, mackerel, sardines, herring, all those kind of oily fish. Um, legumes for their fiber and for their B vitamins, especially folate, beans, lentils, chickpeas, they're a complex carb as well. So they give you slow release sugar into the bloodstream. You know, put them on salads, put them in a soup and blitz them up, use them to thicken soups, um, dips, hummus, all those sorts of things. Dairy products. A lot of people who suffer with migraine are sensitive to dairy and that's due to the histamine content. And we'll talk about that in a second but good quality dairy is an essential part of a healthy diet. Nuts and seeds, non-starchy veg, starchy vegetables, fruits, whole grains, lots and lots of spices and herbs are really, really beneficial. They're very, very therapeutic. Um, I mean, I could spend, I could spend a whole, I could spend probably six weeks going through this dietary plan and explaining it all to you. And I've given Deirdre all the information. So I, if you want the information, I think it's best to get it from her because I don't want to waste all of our time on that. Because I know we want to talk about histamine and we want to talk about Christmas. So care with histamine containing foods. An awful lot of people who suffer with migraine will know that if they have particular foods, it can trigger a migraine or drinks if they have red wine, for example. If they have cheese, for example, it can trigger a migraine. Fermented foods like um, yogurt can trigger a migraine. So what is the deal with histamine? So we have this image is very, very helpful because it's quite representative of what's going on in the body. We have a, what we call a histamine bucket and lots of different things contribute to the histamine bucket. Um, High histamine foods is one of them. Stress, hormones 
her diet, her environment, medication, allergies. So all of those things, other things listed there are gut bacteria are things that can trigger inflammation. And when inflammation is triggered, it causes our immune cells to release histamine. And I'm gonna show you a little schematic of that in the next slide. When our bucket becomes full and begins to overflow is when we experience symptoms. So if you are getting symptoms of migraine from particular foods, that's an indication that your histamine bucket might be almost full. And when you have a couple of glasses of wine, it triggers a migraine because the histamine level just goes too high. Now we get rid of histamine by using this enzyme Dow in our digestive system or HNMT. Now HNMT breaks down histamine within, inside the mast cells. Dow breaks down histamine in our bloodstream via the gut, it exists in the gut. So when our pathways for the removal of histamine get overwhelmed, and that can be due to genetic issues, or it could be just the sheer volume of histamine. You know, we're in a high inflammatory state and we just have loads of histamine and we're eating loads of histamine foods. I mean, even myself, I'm, I'm high histamine myself. I couldn't ever eat strawberries or pineapple when I was growing up because I would get hives. So I know I'm a high histamine person. So where does all of this histamine come from? A very, very small amount of it actually comes from our diet. The majority of histamine comes from our mast cells. So this is an immune cell. It's just sitting there minding its own business, you know, and inside there, that's where HNMT, N-methyltransferase is breaking down histamine and removing it. There may be a genetic issue with that, which means your mast cells are really full of histamine all the time. Some antigen comes along, pollen or some piece of food that's not digested properly, and our immune system sees it, activates, and the mast cell bursts. And it releases all this histamine into the bloodstream because it thinks it's under attack. The immune system is responding to what it perceives as an attack. Um, and if you imagine what it's like when you cut your skin, you cut your skin, it gets all red and swollen and all this blood rushes to it. That's and it swells. The swelling is the histamine and the histamine makes the blood cells more permeable to allow more blood to get in there and to allow all these other chemicals to get in there to address the cut that's on your skin. And that can be happening inside the body, that inflammation. If you have high levels of inflammation in the body, it will be causing your mast cells to degranulate all the time and put, throw your mind back now to when I told you about the microglia being an immune cell and they're the predominant immune cells in the brain and they can be releasing histamine all the time. Okay, so I could go into this in a lot more detail, but what I wanted you to kind of grasp is our histamine levels are very, very much controlled by immune responses and anything that's triggering an immune response within the body will cause our inflammation levels to be higher. Now, what's the link between histamine and estrogen? So the classic symptoms of histamine, high levels of histamine, gastrointestinal dysfunction, um, altered bowel function, abdominal pain, nausea, sometimes vomiting, cramps, reflux, headaches and migraines, definitely a symptom of high histamine levels, joint pain, swelling of tissue, brain fog, um, a runny nose, uh, sneezing, I myself for years, if I'd have a couple of glasses of wine, I'd wake up the next morning with puffy eyes, a runny nose, sneezing, really irritated. What does estrogen have to do with it? So the majority of women who develop histamine intolerance, which has been coined as a condition now, are women. So there appears to be a connection to female hormones. So think back to your full histamine bucket. If you get symptoms like a headache or a migraine, or anxiety or gastrointestinal issues right before ovulation or premenstrually, because you can see in this diagram, that's when estrogen peaks, right? Right before ovulation. It's related to this. Estrogen rises dramatically here before ovulation. And estrogen is higher premenstrually here relative to progesterone, which naturally declines. So when women reach this part of their menstrual cycle where estrogen rises, this naturally drives up histamine levels. 
and the two kind of feed each other. High estrogen causes high histamine and high histamine fuels further estrogen. So it's common to kind of start suddenly experiencing the symptoms in perimenopause and menopause as well, because although estrogen levels are declining, eventually, you know, post-menopause, progesterone declines first. So relative to progesterone, our estrogen levels are quite high and that can drive histamine intolerance for women who are in perimenopause and menopause. Um, so the relative balance between estrogen and progesterone is really, really important to histamine levels. And there's loads of studies. So you look online, you'll find hundreds of studies that have demonstrated that estrogen elicits the activation of mast cells. So if you think back to those mast cells from the previous slide, high estrogen causes those mast cells to degranulate or to burst and release histamine into the system, into the bloodstream. So it kind of becomes a vicious cycle there. So that's the kind of link between the two. Um, histamine and estrogen have diverse effects themselves. They're regulated by very complex processes, but either one in excess can be problematic, but there's an interesting relationship between the two as well. Um, and progesterone inhibits uh, histamine secretion. So if your progesterone is very low, you won't have that inhibitory action either. So this slide is gonna scare you scare you because this is the effect of histamine throughout the body and I just wanted to demonstrate to you all of the zones of influence of histamine um, and you can take a look at this in detail yourselves afterwards once it's released it has all the effects in the body its immune role is the most well-known one you know in immune response but it has lots of others um, you know it's involved in stomach acid secretion regulating your heart rate, your blood pressure, smooth muscle contraction. It's a really important neurotransmitter. It's involved in wakefulness and cognitive function. So it's essential, but in too high a level, it can be really detrimental. So the key takeaway, there's a real link between menstrual cycle, estrogen levels, progesterone levels, and histamine. If you can link your migraine to histamine-like responses, you know, which can include migraine to your cycle, if you can link those, then there's definitely a connection to your estrogen and progesterone levels. And you would need to work with somebody to review your hormone levels and, and how to support removing some histamine and lowering the level within your bucket. So I've seen a lot of talk about migraine diaries and I see a lot of that on the Migraine Association's website taking note of the timing of your headaches through your menstrual cycle if you're still menstruating is really really important and um, so healthy diet as well you know avoiding foods like cheeses aged cheeses processed meats alcohol around that time could be helpful to you as well um, and then of course we can get into the area of xenoestrogens and you know synthetic estrogens in our environment plastics and in Teflon and our cooking materials and all those sorts of things you know, we could go on forever talking about it but so back to the order of priorities where do we start we've started with food okay the mito food plan if there's histamine sensitivities we need to leave out those histamine containing foods temporarily while we address the gut and I'm not going to say much about the gut because that could be like a six week course all on its own. But it's really important because the brain, the central hub of the body influences the gut. And it can influence digestion, inflammation, the balance of the organisms within our gut. But there's also influence going the other way. The gut influences the brain too. The really funny story, actually, my husband is a an architect and he worked on the design of croke park and he told me that when they were designing the men's toilets so these are for the players in croke park they had to put triple the amount of cubicles in to the male changing rooms because everybody needs to go to the bathroom before they go out to play the big match so that's the anxiety and the stress of going out to play the big match has a huge impact on your gut it makes you need to go to the bathroom so 
An interesting thing is that an awful lot of migraineurs are also diagnosed with IBS. It's a very, very common thing. And both conditions have a lot of similarities. Um, so being aware of dietary triggers of IBS, they're often the dietary triggers for migraine as well. Um, there's definitely a histamine connection. There's a connection to elevated toxic load. Um, and then there's immune stimulation because of food reactions. Um, I just want to mention dysbiosis briefly. So an imbalance between the good and the bad bacteria in the gut can definitely trigger headaches. Um, bad bacteria in the gut elevate the overall toxic load. They generate food sensitivities, which generates inflammation and you know, immune responses within the body. And pathogenic bacteria or bad bacteria also have a thing in the cell wall of the bacteria called lipopolysaccharide. And when bad bacteria are dying off, they release this lipopolysaccharide into the bloodstream. And that triggers inflammation. And inflammation triggers the release of histamine from our immune cells. So it's, it's all connected together, it's all connected. It raises our histamine levels. Um, so in migraine clients I have at the moment, I always do a gut test on them. Um, commonalities I see amongst them, they always have an overgrowth of some form of pathogenic bacteria, some form of dysbiosis or imbalance. They always have very, very low levels of probiotics, mostly bifidobacteria. And bifidobacteria are the one that declines as we age and are very, very closely related to decline of our cognitive function. Um, so lifestyle modification, and I'm gonna wrap up now here. I'm just gonna get into the Christmas stuff. I know I'm, I'm be about two minutes over time probably, Deirdre, I hope that's okay. Um, for lifestyle modification, we're looking at the bottom of the matrix. So there's so much to cover here. You know, I don't want to, you know, keep you any longer than I have to, but this really involves speaking to the client and trying to identify what they feel from a lifestyle point of view might be a trigger for their symptoms, but also what they feel are the most realistic things for them to change. So I often find if we look at sleep, getting outside for some daylight, getting to bed by 10, turning off devices and doing a little bit of exercise, you know, even 15 or 20 minutes of walking every day, stress levels tend to drop off and our resilience is bolstered and we can cope with stressful situations a lot better. So stress we know also increases inflammation in the body. So anything that it raises our inflammatory level is not going to be beneficial to us. But keeping in mind, everything's connected. All of this is very, very personal and it's very individual and we have to work through it all um, in a one-to-one -one manner with each client. So challenges at Christmas. For migraineurs, but for everybody else, number one, sugar and processed foods and low nutrient density. So <laughs> eating all the crap and not eating all the good stuff. That's the challenge. Chocolate, too high in sugar. It's also high in histamine. Alcohol, too high in sugar. It's also high in histamine. Overindulging, and I was talking about, you know, rebooting your computer earlier, not giving your body a break is a big challenge at Christmas. You know, eating all the time and eating late into the night, snacking at night. Gluten, if you know that you're sensitive to gluten, it's very difficult to avoid it. The mince pies appear and it's very difficult not to have gluten. Um, stress, financial stress, organizational stress, family stress, uh, relationship stress. All of those things appear at Christmas time. Lack of exercise, big issue at Christmas time. You know, we basically sit around a lot at Christmas time. And there's many, many, many more, I'm sure, right? There's a lot of foods that are high in histamine and tyramine, which can contribute to the symptoms of migraine. I've given you a list of them here, okay? If you look too closely into this list, it actually gets very depressing. <laughs> aged cheeses, sugary foods, processed meats, smoked fish, desserts, um, chocolate. I've given them all to you. You can look through the slides, see what you think. 
But if you know that there is a histamine connection to your migraine and that it's a trigger for you, take a look at this list. Be mindful about the amounts of these foods that you're eating, how many of them you're eating together at the same time and how frequently. Give your body an opportunity to try and empty that bucket. Um, should you eliminate high histamine foods forever? Absolutely not. So it's not safe to eliminate entire food groups forever. It's just not safe. It's not advisable. We need to get to the root cause of what's causing you to react to those foods. So what is causing your histamine levels to be high in the first place? Now, there may be a genetic issue that you find it difficult to break down and remove histamine from the body. And if there is, what are you going to do? Are you going to eliminate these foods from your life forever? My suggestion would be no. So we need to find a way of coping with the high levels of histamine. Now, you can be mindful about the amount of histamine that you're taking in, but also we need to get back to kind of the two simple questions we started with. What do we need to get rid of that's causing the elevation of histamine in your body? Toxins, allergies, infections, diet, stress, all of those things. And what do we need to add to optimize the function of your systems? You know, do we need to sort out our gut? Do we need to work on stress levels? Um, 